a treat. It's so great to see you. Um, I'm Laura Heisler. I'm Director of Programming for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Director of Outreach for the Mortgage Institute for Research, and a close partner with the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery. These are the three organizations that partner to create the Crossroads of Ideas series. Uh, the hallmark of this series is that we try to feature a topic that matters to all of us in our lives, and it's also the subject of study here at UW-Madison. We feature this series roughly about once a month during the academic year. This will be our final session for this academic year, and we'll be kicking things off again in the fall. If you got an email for tonight's lecture, you'll get emails in time to sign up for all of those. And if you didn't, uh, please go to the wharf.org website and find your way to the events and programs page and um, sign up and let us know that you'd like to be on our email list. Uh, before I get things started with logistics for this evening and kicking off speakers, I would like to ask you to join me in taking a moment to acknowledge the land that we are on here on campus and that many of you are on, those of you joining us via Zoom. UW-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Tejope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison re respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Uh, so for tonight's session, as is always the case with Crossroads of Ideas, we will be welcoming your questions towards the end. We're going to hear from each of our two main speakers, and then we'll have a discussion that our moderator, who I'll in introduce shortly, uh, will facilitate. And then we will make sure to turn things over for your questions. If you're here in the room, we're going to ask you to make a line in front of the microphone that's here in the middle of the room. That way we're not passing it and we're not all worried about sanitizing the microphone. So just please line up. If you're joining us via Zoom, please use the Q&A function, not the chat, but the Q&A function to um, ask your question. I will read your question to the panel, to the speakers, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. We may not get to all of them. We'll, we'll try our best. Please keep your questions concise, and that way we'll get to even more. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce the curator and um, the visionary for this this series that we've been bringing forward, the Big Question series. This is again the final edition in that series. Uh, Larry Shapiro, who is the Barrett Ench Professor of Philosophy here at UW Madison, to tell you a little bit more about the series, how tonight's session came about, and then he'll introduce our moderator and we'll get things going. So thank you, and please welcome Larry Shapiro. First, I have to thank Laura for calling me a visionary. That's probably the first and last time that'll ever happen. Uh, but I'll take it. Uh, so this, this is our final event in the uh, Big Question series. The idea behind this series, the guiding idea, is that uh, scientists have uh, started or restarted to talk about the sorts of questions that typically fall within the province of, of philosophers. What is morality? Do we have free will? Uh, what is consciousness? And um, questions like that, the, the big questions. And so I thought it would be an interesting um, series of talks to have a, a, a scientist and a philosopher uh, explaining their particular approaches and perspectives on these issues. And uh, so today, the, the uh, scientist we have is, is Daniel Casasanto and the philosopher is Ross Schaefer Landau. And the topic is morality. When, when philosophers think about the nature of morality, they're typically interested in questions, something like this. Um, so I, I personally have the belief that dessert isn't worth eating unless it's chocolate. A dessert without chocolate's not any good. And you might regard this as an opinion, and it, it probably is. But um, the question uh, a, a moral philosopher might ask is, when I say something like killing is wrong or uh, it, it's good to give to charity, am I similarly expressing uh, the kind of opinion I expressed when saying that uh, dessert without chocolate is, is not worth eating? Or am I saying something more like two times three equals six? Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from Russ about uh, what the right answer to that question is. Uh, psychologists thinking about morality will often ask questions about what, what sort of characteristics might make someone act morally? Uh, are there cultures or, or, or um, individual differences that can explain why some people are more likely to act morally than other people. 
uh, what goes into generating moral behavior. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation tonight. And to moderate is Anne Strainchamps. I'm sure you've all heard of Anne. She is the um, uh, host and co-founder of uh, the Peabody Award-winning radio show on Wisconsin Public Radio, to the best of our knowledge. So I'll now turn things over to, to Anne. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. Delighted to see such a, wow, this is a fantastic crowd. Thank you so much for turning out. Yeah, philosophy lives. So I am delighted to introduce our two esteemed guests. First, we will hear from Russ Schaefer Landau. Professor Schaefer Landau has been on the faculty of the philosophy department at the UW since about 2002, minus a two-year stint at Chapel Hill, won't mention that. He completed his PhD in 1992 at the University of Arizona, and his work focuses on meta-ethics, which asks questions, big questions, about the nature of moral claims, by which I mean if I tell you that some practice or behavior is categorically right or wrong, good or evil, is my claim objectively true? Or is it more like an opinion, as Larry said? Are moral claims eternal truths or more like ice cream preferences. Russ has written six books about meta-ethics, including Whatever Happened to Good and Evil, Living Ethics. He has a se seventh on the way, and he has edited just about as many. He founded the Madison Meta-Ethics Workshop, in case you don't get enough of meta-ethics tonight. Check that out. It'll be at the end of the fall. Last year, he served as president of the American Philosophical Association's Central Division. And hailing all the way from Ithaca, New York, a place colder, believe it or not, than Madison, Wisconsin, Daniel Casasanto is an associate professor of psychology at Cornell University and director of the Experience and Cognition Lab. And he studies how the diversity of human experiences is reflected in the mind, how language and culture and even physical experience shapes the way we think and feel and make decisions. In other words, how we turn concrete experiences into abstract thoughts to entertain philosophers. So to study cognitive diversity across cultures, his lab conducts research on five continents using methods that range from watching kids play to brain imaging to neurostimulation. Daniel Casasanto also, by the way, um, is a former opera singer. And see if you have any luck getting him to tell you more about that. He's a graduate degree from the Peabody Conservatory and a PhD from the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. That was from 2005. His awards include a National Research Service Award from the National Institutes of Health, the James S. McDonald Foundation Scholar Award, and the Distinguished Early Career Award from the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Science, and the Psychonomic Society. And I don't know what psychonomics is, but I don't know. Footnote, maybe. You'll explain. Thank you both very much. And Daniel, I think you're, uh, oh, Russ, you are kicking this off. Thanks, Anne. And Larry, thank you very much for the invite. Uh, I've been at most of these sessions, and they're terrific, and I hope I don't spoil things at the end. Okay, so I'm talking about morality. What is morality? Here's a natural answer. It's that set of norms, guidelines, principles, rules, I'm going to all, use all these terms interchangeably, that govern people, made by people, for one another, in order to uh, regulate their interpersonal uh, behavior, and in order to help foster harmony. Fo uh, the focus is typically on things like conveying self-respect, um, respect for others, justice, responsibility, and enhancing the well-being of people within the community. There's no question that there is a morality, in fact, many moralities that meet that description. Philosophers call these conventional moralities. They are roughly of the same status as laws or the rules of etiquette. They're made by and for human beings. Morality in that sense exists. There's no doubt about that. The question I want to ask tonight is whether or not there's any other kind of morality. In particular, I want to ask whether there's something that philosophers call objective morality, which is a kind of morality. When I use the term objective, this is what I mean. It's a kind of morality whose constituent rules are such that they are true, 
but not true in virtue of anyone's thinking that they're true. In other words, personal opinion, group opinion, is not decisive, it's not determinative, it's not what makes moral claims true. That's what I mean by objective morality. If there is such a thing as objective morality, and we can know it, then we can utilize the elements of that objective morality to assess conventional morality and to see whether where it falls short and where it does well. The question though is whether there is any such thing as objective morality. What I wanna do is I wanna talk about uh, three views tonight, one of which says that conventional morality is the only morality there is. Folks who endorse this idea are called relativists for perhaps an obvious reason. They think that morality is relative to each culture, each society, each group that, gets, that takes the time to regulate their conduct uh, with one another by reference to some shared agreement. Relativists think that's all there is to morality. There are two groups of uh, two camps who disagree with relativists who think there is an objective morality. One group is, no, um, is known as divine command theorists. They think that where morality comes from is God, hence the divine element, God's commands. God commands us to do certain things, forbids us from doing other things. And if you want to know the elements of objective morality, what you have to do is find out what it is that God commands or forbids us. Then there's a third group, um, uh, a proud member of this last group, uh, called moral realists. That's a fancy philosophy term for this kind of view. It says that morality is objective, but no one made it up. It's not objective by virtue of being a divine command. If there is a God, God's perfect, God knows everything, so God knows all, all of the elements of morality, but God is not the author of morality. No one is the author of morality. That view, moral realism, is the third of the views I'm gonna talk about tonight. Okay, so what I want to do is I just want to run through these three views and talk about some pros and some cons of each, okay? Starting with relativism. There are a lot of things to like about relativism. Relativism is quite popular, especially among my students when I teach intro ethics classes. One of the things that is attractive about relativism is that it very directly explains a certain datum about morality. Yes, there are data in philosophy and there are data about morality too. Here's one datum. Moral duties, moral responsibilities are not had by insects, by lecterns, by bottles of water. Why not? Relativists have a, a simple answer to this question. Morality is made by and for human beings. Water bottles don't count. So relativists have a very ready explanation of this datum. Here's another thing that relativism can do, and that is it comports with a, a scientific, respectable worldview in that if you want to know what morality is, you ask scientists, typically not chemists or physics, but sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists. Social scientists can tell us what morality is by telling us how it is that societies convene to work with one another. And that's all there is to morality. What it is that science, social science in particular, can tell us about how human beings interact with one another. So it's scientifically respectable, check. Here's another plus, and that is it easily explains moral knowledge, how to get it and why it is that we have moral knowledge when we do. You wanna know what's right and wrong? Here's the relativist answer. You figure out what society really stands for. My society may stand for something different from yours, and what the relativist says is, that's totally fine. These are just different social codes, different moral codes, no one of which is better than the other. If you want to figure out the answer to a moral question, here's how you do it. You figure out what the society really stands for, where the act, whichever society is that the act you're wondering about is performed in. So if a given society says, yeah, these you know, women are second class citizens, then that's correct for that society. If instead you're in a society that's much more egalitarian, then it's not correct to treat women as second class citizens. What relativism says, though, is that if I want to know how it is I should treat women or anyone, really, the answer is, in principle, easily discernible. In principle, not always in practice. And the answer is, you figure out what the society really stands for. And the last benefit to relativism is its egalitarianism. That just is the, the feature of promoting equality. In the sense, 
What relativism says is it doesn't matter which society's code you're talking about. All moral codes, all social codes, are on a par with one another. No one is better than the other. They're just different. In the same way that codes of etiquette or the law are different. No one is uniquely best. There is no objectively correct set of etiquette principles. Principles, etiquette principles, principles of politeness are made by and for human beings, and they can perfectly naturally find, you know, it's perfectly fine for them to differ one society to another. And that's the same thing uh, that relatives say about morality. Moral codes are human, human constructs, if you like that term, and they just differ one from another, no one of which is better than the other. Those are four benefits of relativism. Here are some problems with it. One is that the basic elements of a social code can't be mistaken. Why not? Because the basic elements of the social code are the ultimate moral principles, according to relativism. So if a society stands for X, X is right in that society. And this actually has a number of serious drawbacks, one of which is that the equal, the egalitarian element that I just touted as a benefit has a flip side. And that is that it's problematic for the following reason. If you're a relativist, you have no basis for saying that one social code is better than another. You might think, awesome, I like that. That, that supports tolerance and attitude of open-mindedness. But in fact, it doesn't do that. What it does is it puts on a par the social codes of Nazi Germany and that of contemporary Norway. It puts on a par the social codes of societies built around the idea that it's okay to enslave fellow human beings. And on the other hand, a, a social code built around the idea that everyone has a birthright of freedom and equality. If you th think, as I do, that some social codes are morally superior to others, that might sound arrogant, but then when you drill down and think about a concrete case of this comparison of the sort I've just given you, I think you might be tempted, as I am, to think, no, it's not the case that all social codes are on a par with one another. Some, maybe none, are ideal. That's very likely. But some are better than, than others, and relativism can't account for that. Let me shift gears and talk now about those who want to place God at the heart of morality in the following way. These are the folks I called divine command theorists earlier. And what they say is this, actions are right just because God commands them, and they're wrong just because God forbids them. And this view's got a lot going for it, too. On the one hand, uh, what, it does, what it says is, well, we've got a source of morality that is free of bias and irrationality. One thing about relativism that I didn't mention is this. No matter the origins of the social code, and as we know, Many social codes are founded on ignorance, irrationality, bias, and prejudice. That social code is the correct moral code for that, for that society. If you've got a divine command theory, you free the source of morality from ignorance and bias and prejudice on the assumption, which I'm prepared to make, that if there's a God, God is free of those taints as well. Okay. So that's one benefit of a divine command theory. Another is this, that it has an explanation of how it is that we come to gain moral knowledge, and that is you need to know what God tells you to do. Now, for some people, that, that seems like a simple task, and maybe it is a simple task. For others, this, this once more could be a, a double-sided, double-edged sword where it may be very difficult to discern what it is that God wants of us. Another benefit, though, is this, that if the divine command theory is true and God is at the heart of, God's commands are at the heart of morality, then we always have reason to do what morality asks of us. Every one of us has, in the course of our adult lives, and, typically, and probably when we were kids too, asked this question, why should I do what's right? Well, if the divine command theory is true, you've got an answer, namely that what you're doing is you're complying with God's wishes for you. And there are lots of reasons to do that. Eternal reward, eternal punishment if you don't. But you can set that aside and just say, I want to be closer to God. If God tells me to do this, I want to model myself and do what I can to approximate God's goodness. And so I'm going to do that. And that's a reason to take morality quite seriously. 
In fact, what it does is this, this theory explains how it is that it purports to explain how it is that morality can earn our respect and be authoritative in the way that many of us want morality to be. It's because it's got a perfect author at its heart. There are problems too with the divine command theory. One of course is that atheism might be true and God might not exist. And if God doesn't exist and the divine command theory is true, then nothing is right and nothing is wrong. Morality is just a sham because it's supposed author doesn't exist. Guess what? I'm not going to take a side on that debate. You can, uh, Larry, you need to have a, a sixth talk. What is God? Okay, but that's not my talk here. Okay. Um, the flip side, as I just mentioned, a, another potential drawback is that it may be very difficult to know what God, if God exists, what, what it is that God commands of us. People within, this is patently true when we uh, come to considerations of cross-religious disagreement, but even within a religious tradition where people are based, uh, basing their ideas on the same text and living within the same living tradition, there are a whole host of disagreements about how best to interpret the edicts of the text and how best to prioritize tradition over that text or vice versa when the two conflict. So there are difficulties in actually discerning what it is, there can be difficulties in discerning, discerning what it is that morality asks of us. But here's the, the biggest stumbling block to divine command theory. Set the two objections I, I put aside. Suppose there is a God and suppose we have a reliable way of discern, discerning what it is that God wants of us. Still, I invite you to, I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious, but I invite you to think about the moment when God is deciding whether or not to lay down the, or, sorry, not whether or not, but what it is to lay down as the law for human beings. So here's the day. I don't know if it's day six or day seven. I don't remember, but here's the day. What am I going to do? What am I going to tell them? Am I going to tell them that torture is just fine? Go for it. Am I going to tell them, don't be compassionate. Don't be kind or generous. Presumably, I mean, if this is not presumptuous to try to, place ourselves in this position, presumably what we're going to say is that if we've got, if we're dealing with a God who is genuinely good, what's, what that God is doing is God is taking a look at actions like genocide and torture and seeing something there, namely a moral value, a moral disvalue in particular. God is seeing that they're bad, those actions are bad. God's examining with perfect wisdom the nature of generosity, compassion, and kindness. And God is seeing something there. God's not seeing a blank and the evaluative nothingness there. What God is seeing is there's something good about those actions. And God, with divine wisdom, omniscience, and with a love and compassion for God's creatures, lays down a law that says, do the latter things, be kind, compassionate, and generous, and don't do the former. On that picture, which preserves the omniscience of God, the all-knowingness of God, and God's perfect moral character, Here's what we've got. What we've got is a set of moral truths that obtain independently of God's say so. God knowing everything and wanting us to know some of what God knows about morality lays down that law for us. But on that picture, which preserves God's integrity, God's goodness, God's omniscience, what we have is an eternal moral law. We don't have a morality that's the invention of God. We have a morality that is infallibly conveyed and relayed to us by God. And that leads naturally to the view that I like, which is moral realism, which says that there are objective moral truths. That is, there are moral truths that are true, but not by virtue of anyone's say so. That's moral realism. And there are things to like about moral realism. I found, of course, a lot of things to like. I wrote a book called Moral Realism, a defense. So I'm a fan. Uh, so here are some of the things to like. On the assumption that God exists, which is not an assumption I'm making for purposes of this talk, but for those of you who are sympathetic to that assumption, if there is such a God, moral realism can explain how God can be perfectly good as theists, those who believe in God, endorse. And here's the answer. There's a set of eternal moral truths, and God's goodness consists in God infallibly and impeccably adhering to those standards. That's what God's goodness consists in. If you think about the alternatives 
the alternative accounts and explanations of what God's goodness amounts to, I think you might be puzzled, but we could talk about that in Q&A. Now let's set God to the side, if only temporarily, to talk about some other pros of moral realism. It explains a data, another datum about morality, and that's our, our fallibility. We're capable of making mistakes. In fact, everyone makes moral mistakes, myself included, of course. No one is morally omniscient. No human being, certainly, is morally omniscient. No human being is morally all-knowing. How's that so? Well, the explanation that the realist gives is this. We don't get to make up what's right and wrong, and that explains why our knowledge of what's right and wrong is limited, and that's the datum I take needs, that needs explaining. It also explains something I mentioned earlier, and that is why it is that some moral code, the possibility at least, that some moral codes are better than others. A moral code that advocates slavery, a moral code that advocates treating women as second-class citizens is not the moral equivalent of a code that advocates the opposite. A moral code that enfranchises everyone, that advocates for the potential of every human being to live a life to their full potential, is a better moral code than one that, of the sort I just described, that touts the benefits of slavery, the alleged benefits of slavery, and the alleged benefits of oppressing women. Moral realism easily accounts for that. And lastly, it also explains why, in some cases, it's very difficult to know what the right thing to do is. You probably have had this experience, I certainly had, where I'm confounded by what to do, morally speaking. I don't know. If morality is just a matter of, you know, whatever, whatever I think is right is right, or whatever my society thinks is right is right, then gaining moral knowledge can be too easy, paradoxically. Moral realism preserves the possibility that things are really difficult in morality. I'm not saying that they always are. There are many easy cases. But moral realism explains why it is that in some cases, it's really hard to know. And that's because morality is objective. It's not something that we get to make up. It's something that our opinions have to answer to. OK, that's the good stuff. I've only gotten a minute and 18 seconds to talk about the bad stuff. Should I just stand down now? Or, OK, so here are some potential worries about the moral realism I favor. One uh, is that it licenses dogmatism. Here's something I hear a lot. Uh, I, I hear this criticism a lot. If you think that you know, there's just one right answer to morality or one or just a small subset of moral codes that are best and the rest are inferior, that's very dogmatic. But I actually don't think that's dogmatic because distinguish two questions. One is, is there an objective morality from two? Do I know all of its contours and details? The answer to the first question, I think, is yes. The answer to the second question is definitely not. In fact, the very possibility of there being an objective morality creates the space for people to admit their ignorance about what that morality requires of us, because we don't get to make it up. So it's, I think the proper attitude to take towards morality is that of modesty and humility. It's precisely because we don't get to have the final word about what's right and wrong that we should take an attitude of humility. Contrast that idea with, with, with this one, which says, you know what, right and wrong is just in the eye of the beholder. If that's your view, which is a form of relativism, then you should go ahead. Whoop. Go ahead and cancel that timer that I don't know how to cancel. Thank you, honey. My wife's here who set the timer up for me. Yeah. Um, if, if, you, if you get to make up what's right and wrong, then you ought to be dogmatic because you know what the ultimate moral standards are. You made them up, after all. Here's a second problem, that, and then I'll quit. And that is the flip side of the problem of tolerance for relativism. A lot of people think that if there's an, such a thing as objective morality, then that licenses intolerance towards the opinions of others. But if we, take, if we um, pick up from the point I just made, namely that the proper attitude to take towards morality is one of humility and modesty, then you can see how that, that combined with the idea that there being an objective morality does not entail that any one person knows the whole of its contents. What that does is that supports an attitude of tolerance. Let me just put, put the point in this way and I'll step down. If you think that tolerance is only of relativistic value, then that is, if you take a relativistic approach to morality, if you, if you take a relativistic approach to morality, 
Now I'm going to throw my phone to the back so it doesn't make any more noise. Then you're required to take this view. Of those societies that endorse the oppression of ethnic minorities, it's right to do so within that society. If you oppose such oppression and speak out, you're saying something that's false and you're acting in a way that's immoral within that society. My view is that tolerance is most valued just where it's least enjoyed. If you share that view, then what you effectively are committed to is the idea that moral values, including the value of tolerance, are universal and objective and not a function of human opinion, whether one or many. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Russ. Uh, I'm leaving my phone uh, at my chair. Uh, so uh, thank you all uh, for this invitation. So the big question that the organizers have posed for us tonight is, what is morality? Now, you may have noticed that Russ didn't answer that question because he chose a different question, right? He wanted to, to talk about uh, where does morality come from, right? And I, I have to admit that I'm not going to answer our big question either, but for a different reason. I'm not going to answer it because I think it's an ill-posed question, uh, a question to which there's no single answer, so it doesn't make sense for us to try to give one. This position is similar to what I interpret the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein as to have meant when he said that the meaning of a word is its use in language. <clears throat> there are lots of constraints on what words mean, but ultimately, each use of a word is going to be idiosyncratic. In work with my University of Wisconsin colleague, Gary Lupien, uh, I've extended this kind of thinking about language into a theory of concepts. And on this view, we can assume that for any question of the form, what is x, where x is some concept that we want to define, the answer will be that depends on the context in which x is being used. The concept of morality is no exception. So I'd like to revise our big question uh, and, and seek to characterize morality in use. Uh, and this means asking something like, how can people be moral? How can people act morally? To address this question, I want to propose a recipe for discerning moral actions and for choosing to enact them. How is a recipe different from a, de from a definition? Well, one advantage of this metaphor is that nobody expects the results of a, re of a recipe to come out exactly the same every time. The same principles should be at work in constructing moral actions every time, even though the outcome of applying those principles in a given context may lead to actions that couldn't be prescribed or predicted out of context. So what's our recipe? What is acting morally? According to this recipe, it is choosing to act, one, in response to what you believe is true, two, in the service of rational concern for people's well-being, three, with the courage to bear the costs that these actions may incur, and four, with the expectation that you and others will fail to act morally over and over, and with the understanding that failure at one moment does not preclude striving or succeeding to act morally in the next. So let me simplify that. Four, four ingredients, truth, rational concern for well-being, courage, and forgiveness. I'll comment briefly on each of these ingredients, but first I need to pull the lens back and preview some of what I will discuss in the next 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> Excuse me, this will be the closest I've ever come to issuing a trigger warning. You ready? I'm going to talk about the Bible and not to denigrate it. Uh, and I appreciate that, that Russ was also talking about uh, uh, issues of the divine and not denigrating uh, spirituality or, or religion uh, or indeed the Bible. Uh, so discussion of the Bible is almost absent from moral psychology. This may be unsurprising given how far religion has fallen out of fashion among people who have PhDs. About one out of every three humans on our planet self-identifies as a Christian, but you would never imagine that statistic looking at the academy. We have become devoutly secular. One of the uh, academics who has upheld the secularity of the academy uh, and argued for secular thought in our society uh, is Larry Shapiro, the, the colleague who introduced us and who invited me to join this discussion. Uh, so Larry's argued that it is irrational and even immoral to believe in miracles like those that are described throughout the Bible. 
we'll have time for discussion toward the end. Uh, and uh, it would probably make for a good show if Larry and I were going to throw down about the status of miracles. Uh, but, but actually, nothing I'm going to say this evening requires us to believe in miracles or in anything supernatural. Nothing I'll say requires us to have faith in God or uh, to believe that morality uh, comes from a divine source. Nothing that I'll say requires us to treat anything in the Bible as literally true or even historically accurate or to embrace any religious practice. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm saying that it's not a precondition for engaging with this talk. <clears throat> You don't have to be religious to acknowledge that the Bible is one of the most enduring and influential pieces of literature ever. I believe this status is well deserved and that our culture is making a huge mistake in our allergy uh, to, to the Bible in, in the academy and dismissing the Bible as a source of accumulated wisdom uh, and as a record of how humans understanding of ourselves changed over time. I'm a psychologist, so out of allegiance to my field, I should probably be championing the role of psychological research in guiding how we live our lives, and I'll do some of that. But actually, I believe that works of literature, stories, and myths have a lot more to teach us about human hearts and minds than anything we've discovered in the lab. As a collection of stories and myths, the Bible encodes some of the most important insights that people have ever had about what enables us to act morally and what prevents people from choosing and sustaining moral action. We can benefit from these insights, whether or not we consider the Bible to be a sacred text. But you can relax for a moment. Uh, I want to start with a wholly atheistic discussion of truth. If the first ingredient in our recipe is acting in response to what you believe is true, this raises the question, how do you know what's true? Well, this question has gotten a lot more complicated recently in what's been called our post-truth era. A lot of people noticed that our culture's attitude toward truth was changing about five years ago when Kellyanne Conway, an advisor to our previous president, coined the phrase alternative facts. I think most people assumed that there was a bedrock of facts, observable events and objects that no two sane people could disagree about. But this bedrock turns to quicksand if we introduce the possibility of alternative facts. People sensed that this move had far reaching implications, one indication. Uh, is that shortly after Conway's interview, sales skyrocketed for George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984. 70 years after its publication, it became Amazon's number one bestseller. But Conway didn't invent post-truth ideology. She just popularized it. A year earlier, the Oxford English Dictionary had already selected post-truth as 2016's word of the year. They defined it as, as uh, denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping opinion than appeals to emotion or personal belief. So does living in a post-truth era preclude the possibility of truth or of us knowing the truth? Well, fortunately, although post-truth messages can mislead people, they're unrelated to actual truth. When Conway suggested there were alternative facts, she wasn't engaging with the notion of truth. Rather, she was producing what the philosopher Harry Frankfurt has defined as bullshit. So it may be surprising to, to the non-philosophers in the room that a serious philosopher developed a theory of bullshit, that it's not a joke, and that I, I believe it's really important. To paraphrase, there are things that are true. These are truths. There are things that are untrue. These are lies. But crucially, truth matters both for truths and for lies. Telling the truth directs attention toward what we believe is true, Lying directs attention away from what we believe is true. Bullshit does neither. Bullshit is an attempt to persuade someone of something, whether or not it's true. The bullshitter's goal is to advance a position that will be advantageous to them, creating an impression, reinforcing an identity, working towards some outcome with total disregard for truth. So is bullshit the same as lying? No, one clear way to distinguish them is that when we produce bullshit, we may incidentally tell the truth. Uh, the bullshitter does not intend to tell the truth. That's not the goal. They intend to create an impression, but they're equally willing to say things that are true or false in the service of that impression. Now, let me mention, I, I've illustrated bullshit with an example from a political conservative, but I'm not suggesting that bullshit is the province of one political type or another. There's plenty of liberal bullshit. Uh, the point is that bullshit is endemic in our, whole, in our culture and that it's on the rise and that it's an enemy of moral action. Getting back to our recipe, figuring out what's true to the best of your abilities is critical for deciding how to act morally. Why? 
Because if you don't know what's true, you can't possibly follow the second part of the recipe, which is acting in accordance with rational concern for people's well-being. Rational concern just means concern based on reason, using facts and logic to try to make informed predictions about the effects that your actions will have on people's well-being, people meaning yourself and others. Uh, rational concern for well-being can't be reduced to consequentialism or utilitarianism, the, the doctrine that the morality of an action is determined just by its outcome. The reason is that you can make a choice out of rational concern that turns out to have a bad outcome. That doesn't mean it was the wrong choice. Maybe you chose what was most likely to have the best outcome for the most people, but in this case, life defied those favorable odds. Conversely, you could make a choice that was reckless, biased, selfish, in some other way, irrational, and yet by chance it has a good outcome. The fact that your action had a good outcome doesn't necessarily mean that you made a moral choice. Choice made out of rational concern is moral because it's your best guess at what will increase people's well-being based on what you believe to be true, even though your knowledge is imperfect and therefore the outcome is uncertain. Is rational concern the same as empathy? Well, no, in some ways it's the opposite of empathy. Empathy or compassion means suffering with someone, experiencing their pain as your pain, feeling their emotions as if they were your own. Post-truth ideology has conflated emotion with reason. And research in moral psychology has emphasized links between empathy and morality, and even suggested that empathy is the path to morality. But if our goal is to choose moral actions, we need to understand why reason is a better guide than emotion alone. The developmental psychologist Paul Bloom wrote a book with the provocative title Against Empathy. You might think that title's got to be just clickbait, right? He can't possibly be against empathy. Isn't empathy inherently good? But Bloom argues that no, actually, empathy can be good, but it's a bad basis for a system of morality. In particular, empathy is myopic. We find it much easier to empathize with people who are close to us than people who are distant socially or geographically. Yet proximity to us, proximity to ourselves, is a terrible index of how deserving someone is of our concern. Bloom admits, if we're honest about our feelings, we probably feel more upset about, say, our internet service being out in our house uh, than about some catastrophe affecting hundreds of people in some country we've never heard of. Even more problematically, we can only really feel empathy for one person or one group at a time. Bloom compares empathy to a spotlight that shines on its beneficiary but leaves everyone else in the dark. This is a problem because rational decisions often require considering alternatives, holding two or more possibilities in mind simultaneously and weighing what's good and bad about each of them. This is a process called dialectical thinking. Well, dialectical thinking is hard to do, but dialectical feeling is virtually impossible. Even if you can understand two viewpoints at once, you can't feel them both at once. And as such, empathy disables the dialectical processes that allow us to compute rational concern. Empathy-based moral judgments will favor whoever we've granted our empathy to at the time. And they may or may not, the, 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 the beneficiary may or may not be the person most deserving of our rational concern. So jumping to our next ingredient, why is courage necessary for moral action? If you know what's true and you know how to act with rational concern, isn't that enough? Well, courage is necessary for a number of reasons, uh, but, but one is that acting morally often comes at a cost. Sometimes the moral choice is a choice that's agonizing to yourself or others. Furthermore, no matter how costly your actions are per se, acting morally may have a hidden cost because your good actions may not be rewarded in the way you think they should be. There's a popular belief that we like to cheer for the good guys, that moral heroes are heroes of the people. But history challenges that belief. Often acting morally doesn't make people like you. On the contrary, if you act morally in any conspicuous way, a lot of people will probably hate you. This may seem counterintuitive, that moral action makes you the target of hatred. And maybe that's why, here, here comes the Bible part, Maybe that's why this message features so prominently throughout the Bible. In the book of Genesis, the second story we ever hear about the earliest humans is the story of Cain and Abel. You may remember, God tells these two brothers that it's time for them to make a sacrifice. Abel digs deep and gives God the very best of what he has to offer. Cain doesn't. 
so God is happy with Abel's sacrifice and not with Cain's. When Cain complains, God tells him that he would be acceptable too if he'd decided to make the same level of sacrifice that his brother made. But Cain doesn't respond by stepping up and trying to do better. He takes another path toward making sure his brother's moral superiority isn't showing him up. He kills the competition. So that's at the very start of the Bible. I want to suggest that the Bible ends with the same message, that the story of Jesus and the people who brought Jesus down recapitulates the story of Cain and Abel. The Jesus character in the New Testament we are told, spent his days in the service of others, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, teaching people to love one another. So why was he condemned to death? Well, if you remember, the leaders of his own people had him killed, the priests of the Jewish temple. Why? Well, the story gives a clear answer. It's because Jesus made the high priests feel bad, or more to the point, he made them feel not good enough. The writers of the Gospels tell readers over and over how Jesus called out the leaders of the temple, pointing out that they were more interested in making a show of piety than in actually being good. Like Cain, these priests didn't hear the message as a wake-up call and uh, take the opportunity to change. They killed the person whose goodness was an indictment of their own failings. This brings us to our fourth ingredient, which is forgiveness. Why do we need forgiveness in order to act morally? An answer comes even earlier in the Bible. The very first story that Genesis tells us about human beings is the story of Adam and Eve. And the point of that story is also what motivates the whole Jesus story. And that is that we all screw up. In chapter two of Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve and gives them a paradise to live in. By chapter three, they've broken the only rule God gave them. They're kicked out of paradise permanently one mistake, there's no going back. Their path back to the garden, right, is cut off by an angel with a flaming sword. It was the same with Cain. After he killed his brother, there were no second chances. God cursed him for all eternity. Cain had no, no shot at redemption. Well, if after you have a moral failing, there's no chance of redemption, that's a bad place to be. If nothing you can do can possibly restore you to a state of being acceptable, then why should you even try? And this problem is especially bad given the main message of Adam and Eve, which is that we all have moral failings. It's in human nature. With no path to redemption, people are held captive by their own fallibility. And that's the state that the Old Testament of the Bible leaves people languishing, languishing in, languishing in for countless generations, waiting for a Messiah to release them from this captivity, from the bonds of Adam and Eve's original sin, right, and, and, and to forgive them. Well, this is exactly the role that Christians believe Jesus plays, right? He was sacrificed so that people could be forgiven, not just for Adam and Eve's sins, finally, uh, but also for their own. This is a huge change. I believe that this is the, the this, this, this attitude toward forgiveness is the single greatest change between the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. And access to forgiveness is what people need. Forgiveness is necess it's a necessary step on the path from making mistakes to choosing moral actions in the future. Without the assurance that even your worst mistakes can be forgiven, that your slate can be cleaned, you have options for how to respond to your mistakes, but they're, pre they're all pretty bad. Uh, and they all lead you away from the path of moral action. The first option is that you can just accept that, that you are gonna make mistakes and these mistakes are gonna keep accumulating. You will see yourself then like the portrait that Dorian Gray keeps hidden away in his attic. You'll be growing more and more grotesque over time. Once you're on this one-way trajectory, where's the incentive to do good? You're becoming a monster, you might as well act like one. But this path of seeing yourself degrade as your mistakes accumulate, that would actually take a remarkable amount of self-awareness. There's another path that's much more likely, and that is that you deny the monster. You pretend you don't even know there's a portrait in the attic that's changing from bad to worse, and you focus instead on being a good person. Well, deciding to try to be good is fraught since nobody can avoid failing to live up to their own moral code at times. Deciding that you are a good person, that being good is a trait of yours, is disastrous. 
Once you've decided that you're a good person, you lose the ability to see your own bad actions, due in part to a process, a psychological process that's at work in all of us called reduction of cognitive dissonance. Holding incompatible pieces of information in mind, especially information about ourselves, creates dissonance, creates a feeling of discomfort that people respond to automatically and will do just about anything to get out of this bind, to reduce that feeling. How does this process of distance reduction impact our moral actions? Well, once you commit to an identity as a good person, you condemn yourself to a life of self-deception. You will do bad things, everyone does, but you will not be able to see the things you do for what they are because cognitive dissonance kicks in. You can't change things you've already done. You can only change how you feel about them. Therefore, you'll need to construe the bad things that you do as good in order to preserve this image as a good person. There's a terrible irony here that the more strongly you commit to the idea that you are a good person, the higher the moral pedestal that you place yourself on, the more fully this attempt to be good will corrupt you. The higher your moral standards, the more opportunity life provides for falling short of them, and therefore the greater need for self-deception in order to maintain that image. The way to escape self-deception is to acknowledge that we all make mistakes and grant yourself forgiveness for your own bad actions. We need forgiveness in order to maintain our moral code while at the same time maintaining our ability to evaluate our actions truthfully. Forgiveness allows us to keep seeing the truth and to keep choosing to act morally even after we've violated our own code. So to wrap up, I wanna ask, what do we think the status of forgiveness is in our society? Well, there have been some big changes in the past handful of years. Uh, it's easy to bring to mind a catalog of people, politicians, entertainers, academics, maybe someone down, down the hall from you where you work, people who have been judged in a court of public opinion to have committed a moral offense, and they've been summarily condemned for it. In many cases, the lives that these people knew were suddenly gone. This process goes by different names, right? Names that, that, that words that, that we probably never heard before five or six years ago. Deplatforming, if you're in favor of someone's condemnation, canceling if you're against it. But whether you believe this kind of punitive action is right or wrong, two things about these actions deserve consideration. The first is that canceling or deplatforming someone is motivated, at least ostensibly, by upholding a moral code, which the condemned person is thought to have violated. The second is that by design, this condemnation is final. No matter how apologetic the offender may be, forgiveness is not on the table, presumably because in doing whatever they did to earn cancellation, this person has revealed themselves to be irredeemable. And therefore, the moral thing to do is to purify our culture by expunging them from it. There's a problem with this plan. If we devalue forgiveness in our quest for moral purity, then we become incapable of moral action. If we can't extend forgiveness to other people, then it's hard to see why we should extend it to ourselves. If we can't forgive ourselves, then we can't face the truth that we all violate our own moral codes. If we can't see what's true, then we can't act with rational concern for people's well-being. I started this talk with the suggestion that moral action depends on context, and I've sketched a recipe that we can apply across contexts. We are now in a societal context where following this recipe, insisting on truth, rationality, and forgiveness may lead you to decide that the moral choice is the opposite of what everyone around you thinks. Have courage. Thank you. Okay, can I ask you both to join me up here and I'll kick off questions and then we'll open it up to you guys. Thank you, wow, fascinating. So I was thinking um, to be a little uh, practical, I think that we all have the war in Ukraine on our minds. So I wanted to ask you guys to use that as a frame for expanding your thoughts just a little bit. Um, Russ, as a moral realist, you're saying that there are universal, objectively true 
moral claims. So right now, Russia and the West are locked in a conflict in which each believes that the other is morally wrong. Is there a way to prove the truth of a moral claim? I mean, I know you've sort of said, well, these certain objective moral truths simply are true. But is there the philosophical equivalent of the scientific method? Uh, philosophy is not science, in my view. Uh, and if what you mean by a proof is um, a kind of reasoning that begins with a claim that is self-evident to anyone who contemplates it and then moves by deductively logical steps to a conclusion uh, such that everyone who, uh, who can understand the conclusion comes to certify its truth, then there are no proofs in philosophy. If instead what you mean is that it's possible to argue from a true premise or assumption uh, logically to a conclusion that it is true, then there are plenty of proofs in philosophy. I take it what you mean is, is there any way to convince everybody who's party to a disagreement about morality? It would and, make the UN's job a lot easier. Well, <laughs> it would make everybody's job a lot easier. But I, I doubt very much that there is any such thing. And what, what I would say is that to apply, as, as you invited me to do, to apply some of my remarks to the, the current uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, what I'd say is this. If you've got a relativistic view of morality, then so long as, I'm not saying this is true, but so long as the the basic ideals of, of Russian society are such that they favor expansionistic wars, then if that were so, if that were a sociological fact, then from a relativistic perspective, what Russia is doing is, is morally required. It's not just morally fine, it's morally required. For those of us like myself, perhaps everyone in this room, certainly most people in this room who think that what Russia is doing is, is gravely immoral, what a realist is in a position to say is that there are certain objective moral standards, including um, those that require respect for innocent life, that the, uh, whose, which standards are being violated by, by Russian actions. And these standards are not true because Ukrainians believe them, because Americans believe them, because the UN believes them. They are objectively true. And some of us are privy to that truth and others are not. Again, that sounds arrogant, but when you apply it to this particular example, so long as you think there are some clear cases of right and wrong, and this seems just about as clear a one as we've, we've, we've come across in the last many years, then I think that a relativistic analysis of what's, what's at stake morally isn't a feasible one. Daniel, the last item in your recipe was uh, for moral choices was forgiveness. Ukrainian President Zelensky has said repeatedly in the last few weeks that there can be no forgiveness for Russian bombing. As a psychologist slash philosopher, what would you say to him about his moral compass? It's a hard question whether someone can be forgiven after committing acts like, like we believe Putin is, is committing right now. And I think that uh, we have to answer it in two different ways, according to two different dimensions of forgiveness. So the first dimension of forgiveness is practical. It's, it's how do we treat this person? The second is, we could call it moral or spiritual. And that's, that's the one that's going to be more controversial. Uh, the, the, the first, first of all, uh, uh, Zelensky is, of course, empathizing with his people, right? And so his spotlight is on Ukrainians. Now, that doesn't excuse Putin's behavior, but it does explain in part how one could have a, a, a lopsided view uh, of, of uh, what kind of, uh, uh, of, of who, who, is, who, is, uh, who merits uh, what kind of uh, consideration. But does does Putin's do, do Putin's actions uh, merit any consideration whatsoever? Well, from on, on the, the first dimension of forgiveness, the practical dimension, no. If what we're being told by by the press is is accurate, then no, he cannot 
be allowed to continue in what he was doing. What what uh, President Biden said uh, about his remaining power seems seems uh, seems absolutely true. Uh, he must not be forgiven in the sense that he must not be allowed to continue what he's doing. He can no longer be a political or a military leader. The other dimension of forgiveness, it's a little bit harder. So uh, I'm, I, I would assert that even Putin, even Hitler, think of the worst person who has committed the worst atrocities that you can think of, must be eligible for forgiveness. And the reason is that forgiveness and the capacity to change to rethink right the, the this this word that you only hear in in the or the, the, the I only hear in the context of Christianity repent right it means to rethink the capacity to rethink our actions must be available to everyone that is an inalienable inalienable human right and if we strip somebody of the right to change and to rethink and to do better. I, I don't think Putin is going to change and repent and do better. But if we strip him of that right, then we dehumanize him. And I'm pretty sure that we don't make our world a better place by dehumanizing one another. So as you pointed out, it takes courage to live up to one's own moral values. Are there practices you would recommend that we could cultivate if we want to do a better job? of behaving morally? And that's a question for both of you, Daniel. Why don't you start? Uh, could, could we recommend a morality workout, right? Uh, and <laughs> and uh, what would a moral gym look like? Uh, we wouldn't be able to go there because of COVID, but uh, someday. <laughs> uh, so I think that a practice that, that we can cultivate uh, that can help us to uh, uh, find and, and choose moral actions is practicing dialectical thinking. So dialectical thinking, this ability to hold opposing views in mind at the same time and consider what might be right or wrong about both of them uh, is at the heart of both, both ancient Eastern and ancient Western philosophy. It's something that we share uh, between uh, say Plato and Confucius. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Dialectical thinking is essential for rational action, right? And, and certainly for, for choosing uh, actions that, that are in the service of rational concern for well-being. Uh, so if we, if we can practice dialectical thinking, it, it can help us to uh, make rational actions and avoid some real mistakes like uh, us versus them thinking, sorting the world into people who are just good and bad. Not everybody is Putin. Most people are not Putin. Most situations are not genocide. Most people and most circumstances that people find themselves in require much more subtle and balanced thinking than Putin is bad and genocide is bad. So the other thing that, that dialectical thinking can help us do uh, is to stay honest. I've, I've given an argument about how uh, if, you, if you succumb to uh, the, this, this psychological process that's, that's at work all the time in us, this, this reduction of cognitive dissonance, you are fooling yourself, right? We, we lie to ourselves in order to feel less discomfort, less, less cognitive dissonance. And practicing dialectical thinking includes practicing moral thinking that, that allows us to maintain the idea that we have a moral code and sometimes we violate our own moral code and we just need to deal with that. Hmm. Russ, anything to add from the philosopher's no. workbook? Daniel's answer was really nice. And it's he articulated things that I couldn't do. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a, uh, a moral motivator. My, my job is not to identify the moral ideals we all aspire to and then try to figure out the psychological mechanisms that will prompt people to adhere to those ideals. That's, that's way above my pay grade. So I'm happy to defer to a psychologist about that. I guess I was thinking that surely there are some, I mean, what do you teach your students in terms of what do you hope that they leave your classroom with the ability to do? Here's what I don't teach my students. What I don't 
do, though I've, though I've taught many thousands of students in intro ethics, what I don't do is say, here are a list of do's and don'ts. Make sure you memorize that <laughs> and leave my class and take that forever with you. I'm not trying to tell them what's right and wrong. I'm trying to get them to think better. And, and Daniel nicely identified various ways in which we can we philosophers, as well as psychologists, certainly, can help people think better about what's right and wrong. But having a battery of motivations, like being recognizing that one's going to make mistakes, recognizing that one say so doesn't make things so, that, that one is fallible, these are all very helpful aids in getting to the point of becoming a more morally sensitive person. But I don't myself try to inculcate in my students a certain conception of virtue, a schedule of duties that they have to take away with them. Yeah. Sounds good. Do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, come on up to the come on up to the microphone if you got a question, and if um, <clears throat> that, we might as well we could get a little line going. Um, just be efficient. And Laura, if we have questions for, uh, coming in online, I hope you'll share those too. Hello, hello. Yep, it's on. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the speakers uh, and the organizers of this event. I very much appreciated it. It was very interesting. So my question is directed towards the psychologist, uh, Daniel Casanto. Is that right? Isn't that mm -hmm. good? Your name? Very close. Very close. Okay, <laughs> that's good. So you were talking when you were talking about uh, re what was it? A reduction of cognitive dissonance. It sounded a lot like relativism to me. So I was, you know, it's this kind of assumption that uh, everything you do is good. And to me, the only way to formulize such a stance is to simply say, it's good, because I've done it, or because I say it's good, which is a lot like relativism. So now my question is, do you think relativism is a kind of reduction of cognitive dissonance? So cognitive dissonance applies in lots of cases beyond the ones that we were talking about today. Uh, and the, the, I think the connection that you're making is that if you have adopted the stance that you are good, then cognitive dissonance is going to work against you in, in, a, in a way that's destructive. Um, but uh, the, the, this is something I hadn't thought about before. Is cognitive dissonance uh, an engine of moral relativism? Um, I think I think you may be onto something there. Thank you. Uh, is Laura's mic on? Great um, question for Russ. So I've I admit that I've always been baffled by moral realism. Uh, but hearing you talk about it makes me think that maybe I'm a, a, a closet moral realist all along. So, uh, <laughs> but maybe not, maybe not. So on the one hand, I think uh, morals don't exist in the ether. It, we, we make them. Um, but on the other hand, I, I don't think that all moral systems are equally good. Uh, now, what would make one moral system better than another? Well, it might promote human flourishing, however one defines it. It might promote greater stability, right? So there are all kinds of moral systems that um, are inherently unstable, that lead societies that practice them to fall apart. So they get selected out through cultural evolution. Um, there's nothing um, objective about it. It's if, if we had a different biology, if we had a different psychology, it could be very different moral systems that would work. Right, and so on this view, there's no reason to expect another species, intelligent species, uh, to have a, a similar uh, moral system or to converge on similar moral truths. And so, what what am I <laughs> if I believe this? <laughs> you're, you're puzzled. That's what you are. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So let me just ask you, um, sir. Uh, you say that you've got. You can reject moral realism, but nevertheless assess some moral codes as better than others by reference, for instance, to whether or not one promotes flourishing, one uh, is, does a better job of promoting stability. What I'd say is, what's, what do you take the value of flourishing and stability to be? Is flourishing something valuable just because you happen to think, yeah, that's great? Is, 
is it because is it valuable because our society values it, or is it instead for some other reason? I mean, the, right. Some of some dimensions are more universal than others, right? So avoiding suffering, diminishing pain, right, um, increasing choices, right, is generally favored. Whereas, you know, what is the emphasis on living a meaningful life? For example, how important is that? Well, it really varies from culture to culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, so some of these things, if you have, you know, humans uh, developing um, quasi-independent moral system, right, there are going to be similarities because we're, we're all human and we, 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 we have a kind of psychic unity. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, does that make those things objective? No, it doesn't. Uh, absolutely not. Um, it could be that certain things are the uh, certain claims or views are the object of consensus universally. And yet the, there needn't be anything objective about that. It may be, I don't know, I defer to anthropologists and psychologists about this, but maybe that there's universal consensus that eating, uh, eating feces is disgusting. But that there's unanimity about that, supposing there is, does not make that aversion in any way objective or does not make the claim it's disgusting objectively true. So universal consensus is not by itself sufficient to make anything, to make a claim objectively true. But importantly, I think disagreement, even widespread disagreement, is not sufficient to make and, and or even to show that the claim is not objective. Here's a claim, God exists. That claim is objectively true or it's objectively false. I'm not going to say which one, but our say-so doesn't make that so. There's huge disagreement about the claim that God exists, a God that is the creator of the universe who's all perfect, say. There's huge disagreement about that, and there's likely no proof that's going to convince every rational individual about one, taking one stand or another on that claim. Nevertheless, that claim is objectively true or it's objectively false. So disagreement, deep, persistent, widespread disagreement is not sufficient to show that a claim is false. So the fact that there is such disagreement about a number of moral issues is not by itself sufficient, I think, to threaten the objectivity of morality. Thanks. Go on. We do have some online, so maybe we can intersperse. Mm -hmm. um, we have one from an anonymous attendee who's asking, is it possible to develop moral superiority? If so, by use of what source material or by superior character or superior intellect? How do you get the right answers in moral realism? Well, if by moral superiority, when I hear moral superiority, I hear I'm superior to you. That's not an attractive character trait. I don't want to <laughs> offer advice on <laughs> how to become morally superior in that sense. If what anonymous means is how is it possible to become morally better, to make moral progress in the development of one's character, I'd really, I think that what Daniel said earlier on in response to the question is spot on. It's, do a good, a fair bit of self-examination and then undertake some of the other steps that Daniel recommended. That's my advice. Okay, so this is kind of a question for both of you, but I was just kind of wondering where this claim stands with both of your ideologies and the fact that morality is almost equivalent to time and the fact that they are both fake, there are social constructs that we have created simply for the idea of structure. Their details don't matter because they constantly change in order for us to be able to find meeting and structure within society and life in general. <laughs> I, I think that's a, uh, a deep insight that all of these constructs that, that we give labels to uh, and treat as if they exist out in the world, uh, it is likely that, that for any one of these, if you, if you dig deep enough, you'll realize that we have made these things up. And that doesn't make them less real. That makes them equally real to everything else that we've made up. Thank you. Can I just, that, that seems like a I, good analogy for what you no, were. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, what Daniel gonna... takes is a deep insight I take to be a deep mistake. But I'm sorry, Ann, I interrupted you. Well, let me just dig further into my mistake, and then you can, you can enjoy correcting me. Um, so 
we have different words and terms and definitions for time and different cultures do. However, time, it does exist as a force. We attempt to describe it in different ways, but there is an objective underlying force in the universe called time. Is that what you're, you mean when you talk about objective moral truth? I do mean that, however, unbeknownst to almost everyone in the world, but, to, but known to some people in this room, because there are some philosophers in this room, there is a whole subdiscipline of philosophy called the philosophy of time. And it's a very vexed issue, whether time is in fact a human construct or whether it's more objective in the, in the way that you think. And, and I'm not an expert there, so I'm not gonna get involved in that debate. However, if, you, if, if given your conception of time, Anne, what you're asking me is, is that the way I see morality? The answer is yes. I don't, in fact, think of it as a human construct. We certainly invented the word morality and the cognate words in other languages. We may have invented concepts, moral concepts, to denote what we're trying to convey when we talk about someone's being morally blameworthy or morally praiseworthy for something. But my own view, what I'd say is your question is based on an assumption that I don't accept, which is that what we're doing when we're moralizing, thinking about morality, is basically rationalizing, trying to make sense of things of, of a value-free, morality-free world that helps us to sustain a coherent outlook on the world. I think that I think that's part of what goes on, but I think that we can do it better or worse, and when we do it better, what we're doing is we're appreciating the nuances, the details, the contours of a moral reality that is not of human manufacture. It's not of anyone's making. So when, for instance, we make a determination, this is meant to be an uncontroversial case, that genocide is immoral, what we're doing is we are helping, to make, helping ourselves to develop a coherent picture of the world. But in so doing, we're latching onto something that's true, not because we think it's true. It may serve the purpose that you were describing, but only because being in closer contact with reality can serve that purpose. And part of reality is a moral reality that forbids certain things and recommends certain others. Thank you. Thanks. I'll go with one online from Joe Goss. Given the degree to which humans have exploited, consumed, and destroyed the planet, is it time for us to define a morality of our collective home? How would such a morality differ from one focused on humankind? Would one of the frameworks outlined by the speakers support this morality? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> so, it, there is a lot of, that's a glib answer, there's a lot of work being done by philosophers in environmental ethics. There's a lot of very serious thinking going on about what our responsibility is for the planet individually and collectively. That is something that philosophers can help us think about. Um, one large strand within that very large field is, is questioning the, the paramount importance that we human beings place on our own species. My own view is that only a certain, uh, in, in order to be eligible to be uh, assigned moral duties, moral responsibilities, in order to be eligible for your actions to be morally appraisable, you have to have some serious brain power. But that doesn't mean that only human beings are within the moral community. Our cat is, has moral standing. Our cat is morally important. Our cat has no conception of moral duty. And when our cat does things that damage our home, we don't blame our cat. I might yell every now and then, but that's irrational. Um, <laughs> so I think there's room within a view of the sort I've described to expand the circle and to allow for many more things than just human beings to count morally. Hi, um, I'm not quite there yet, so, and this can be for either one of you, but I'm just trying to understand what would be, what could be a framework or a working definition for recognizing a spectrum of 
what we'll call what you're calling objective morality or objective set of morals. What's what's a, what's a way to know to distinguish between that and any of these other you know, you know uh, God uh, God based or or um, or people subjective moral standards. Uh, I'm not sure I'm capturing your question. Are you, are you asking me to like clarify the difference between relativism and divine command theory and realism? Or are you asking? No, you did a that. You okay. did that. But I think okay. I'm stuck on understanding what are objective morals above and beyond uh, our personal subjectivity and things that different societies have created and um, are you know things that we're bringing to it as as human be as sentient human beings. Yeah. So I, I, I could offer a naive perspective. Uh, so, so the, the, the naive perspective, and, and Russ can, can uh, correct me or fill in the blanks, uh, is that one dimension that, that uh, is worth considering is uh, uh, morality based on intentions versus morality based on outcomes. And certainly there, there have been uh, moral theories that, that uh, hew closely to, to one or the other of those. And one of the reasons that that, that comes to mind uh, uh, with respect to your question is that this varies across cultures and one of the one of the ingredients that I think any uh, any moral theory is, is going to have to to uh, consider is truth right what constitutes truth and that's something that that varies along this intention versus outcome dimension across cultures there is uh, field work in the Mopan Mayan uh, suggesting that uh, what counts as lying depends on outcomes in a way that seems really foreign uh, to, to members of our culture. So if, if uh, I tell you something uh, that I know to be a lie, but that thing that I, that lie that I told inadvertently comes true, I'm not lying anymore. Is that, is that how you would consider uh, the, the, the status of my, my truth or lying? No, but it's not unsystematic and it's not crazy, right? It is, it is an outcome-based theory of, of truth versus lies, uh, whereas we have a much more intention-based theory. That's a, uh, uh, that, that's a, a cultural preference. That's a nice example. I want to give another sort of example to, to fend off a concern that might be yours, I'm not sure, but I know that many people have about a view like mine. A lot of people think that, well, if, you're, if you endorse moral realism, you've got to say that there's the very same, the very same things kinds of actions are required in every society at all time, no matter what. And there is no legitimate realm of cultural divergence of practice. But that, in fact, is not an implication of the view I hold. Just to give you an example, it may be the case that there is some moral imperative to honor one's near and dear, okay? however the near and dear are defined. Okay? And that's what's objective. But the, the form that such honoring takes can legitimately differ from society to society based on cult various different cultural expectations. This isn't relativism, because the moral standard at play is objective. Honor the, you know, one's in-laws, say, or honor one's nuclear fit, whatever, whatever it is. Honor one's near and dear. Whatever the content is, that's universal and objective, but there are legitimate way, legitimately different ways of respecting that imperative that can come from different cultural backgrounds. And that by itself is not a threat to the sort of view I hold. Okay, thank you. Both of those answers were helpful. Thanks. Thanks. We have, we have one online that um, may not be a quick answer, but why be moral? Is the premise of morality at the level of each human and in effect an attempt at a hopeful bargain? If I do good and moral, I may expect to, sorry, um, another thing, I expect to be rewarded uh, and the society, um, and the society sustains moral conduct by upholding the bargain. Yeah, I think I can deal with that in five seconds or less. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Danny, do you want to take no, no, first you. Well, I think that there is an assumption behind this. Here's the question, why be moral? As you filled out that question from the, the listener, I think there was a, a certain assumption, namely that 
the only legitimate reason to be moral is to advance one's self-interest, you know, to, to in some way benefit yourself. That I think is a mistake. So a, a number of people, uh, a number of people hold that kind of view. Myself, I don't think that the only reason to do something is because it's going to get you something. There, that is a reason and a legitimate reason in many contexts to do things. Like I brush my teeth every night. I take 30 seconds. That, 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 that. Why am I doing that? To benefit myself. There's nothing illegitimate, morally illegitimate about that. Uh, and that's, of course, just a little banal example. But I think what the questioner is assuming is that the only legitimate reason to be moral is because it's going to get me something even better than any sacrifice I'm called on to undertake in order to comply with, with the demands of morality. But that, I think, is mistaken. And you know, Daniel gave some nice examples where the virtuous of the first, they're not nice examples, they're, they're really illustrative of this phenomenon, which is sometimes the virtuous of the first to die. If the only reason to be moral is to help yourself out in some ways, then those virtuous people have no reason to be virtuous. That's not my own view. So. Yes. Um, hello, my question is for Daniel. You talked about forgiveness for immoral actions based on the reason that everyone commits immoral actions, right? And everyone has the capacity to perform moral actions as well. But doesn't that sort of equate or equalize every moral action? Like there's no scale, like the action is only really immoral or moral, but not how immoral? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand. So we all have the capacity to, to do moral things and immoral things. Um, but do, do we do we differ in our extent to do really, really good or really bad things? Is that the... No, my question is, to what extent should an immoral action be forgiven? Like, mm. for example, the Russia example, or maybe yeah. it's like not donating or something. So yeah. if you forgive everything, doesn't that sort of equalize every uh, immoral action? Like every immoral action is, is equally weighted? I think that uh, the outcome of an action is or orthogonal to its forgivability. So there are there are little peccadilloes that, that are forgivable, and there are horrible atrocities that are no less forgivable in the, the second sense of, of forgiveness, in the spiritual sense, where if, if somebody is not granted the possibility uh, to, uh, to, to, to rethink and do better, uh, then we have stripped them of something that makes them human. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have about two minutes left, just so you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think I'm actually most simpatico with uh, Gary, who asked a question earlier, which is I think I'm also a moral realist, but I have like a, a specific kind of problem. So I wanted to address it to Russ, which is I, I guess you could call a kind of access problem, which is maybe there is like this objective moral truth in the world um but how do i know that i have access to it like how do i know that i'm how can i have some confidence that i've actually tapped into that like if it were the case like uh that there is an objective moral truth but it included things like genocide is okay i think you would probably say that i've like done something wrong in assessing the morality of that situation mm -hmm. right but i also don't know exactly how i would have like good reliable access to that moral truth whether it's do i get that from my emotions do i get that from uh, a kind of deductive reasoning um do i do it by like reading great works of literature like uh, how do how do i have confidence that my version my uh i don't want to say version my my apprehension of that moral truth is correct uh you're asked so i have about 30 seconds to answer one of the hardest problems in philosophy I, I you. thank you very much so what i want to so my answer my quick answer is all the above and many others there's no algorithm such that anyone regardless of their moral maturity moral sensitivity can just follow the algorithmic process start here and be guaranteed that they've got the truth at the end of that process they're just, if there were such, then we'd have four-year-old moral prodigies who've mastered the algorithm in the way that some have mastered chess, for instance. 
we don't see that. That's, that's not a plausible scenario. <clears throat> so I wish I had a simple recipe and formula or even an algorithm, but if we but the absence of any such is a reflection of the complexity of morality. I think that you do have warranted confidence in some, there, I think there are easy cases in morality. You have warranted confidence that genocide's immoral. Mm -hmm. The question is how you can have that, um, maybe after we turn off the mics and have a little more time, we can talk about that. Sure, yeah. sure, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, last one. So uh, I guess, my question is for us, uh, so as a working philosopher, like, what is the difference between being a moral realist or a relativist? Like, in the day to day, like, if, like, how did, would you, like, why is it reasonable to assume that there is, you know, an objective moral reality or moral truth? And what does that difference look like as like a researcher? Other than like, so like, there's a similar debate, like, you know, as a professional mathematician, like, is math created or invented? It looks the same, the end product. Um, but, you know, I think about it one way, like I'm accessing things that are already there. I'm discovering something that was already true. Mm -hmm. But the world looks the same as if I was one who invented that. So I yeah. guess, like, what does the difference look like to you? The difference looks, uh, that's a great question. And it, the difference looks uh, like this. If I were a relativist, I'd be compelled to affirm the value of certain things that I find repugnant. Mm -hmm. And I'd feel compelled to denounce the value of certain things that I exalt. Mm -hmm. For instance, if I, were in, if I were born in a society that was itself deeply intolerant of homosexuals, for instance, then morally speaking, my practice would have to be, if I wanted to be a moral person, my practice would have to be to join in the den denunciation of homosexuals. Mm -hmm. I find that morally abhorrent. My Realism allows me to say that just because a given value is socially ratified does, is not the last word about morality. My society, myself, and my society can be deeply mistaken about what's right and wrong. And that on the ground is, is one, perhaps the largest practical difference in, in how things look, depending on your theoretical background. Thank you. I want to thank everybody here. It is just so heartening to see a room full of people and wonderful scholars come out and think really deeply about the nature of goodness and about trying to be better people, to think about truth and, you know, um, to tackle tough questions. Thank you very much Our for pleasure. sharing.